Good morning. Uh, my name is Harvey Six. I'm the leader of Bentley District Council, uh, and it's my responsibility today to welcome you all here, but also to welcome Sue and Stevens, the Police Commissioner, to Bentley District to Bentley, and to make it very clear, Sue is here as part of her approach to the Commissioner role. She is here to share her ideas, but also to listen to your concerns. Clearly, she has a very challenging role, a new role, and it's a very challenging area because of the very diversity. We have the large Bristol bit, and then, in area at least, a very large rural bit. And she has a huge balancing task with her chief constable in policing that area. Around here, clearly, we are concerned. We have our small towns, but they have their problems, and antisocial behaviour, I'm sure, will come up more than once this morning. We also have large rural areas where policing is sparse. Crime may also be sparse there, but it is very much still on everybody's fear of crime that I know people will want to articulate. I hope, please, that everybody will remember that this is a, a very public meeting and ask them to ask their questions politely and allow Sue the time for the answers. There will be a couple of presentations first and then there will be questions. Uh, I'd like to hand you straight over to Sue to start from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, today is the, um, the first of our public forums that we are going around Avon and Somerset with the Chief Constable and the District Commanders. And during the campaign, I always made it very clear that what I wanted was to make the police more open and accessible and transparent. And this is really what this meeting is all about. So we have the Chief Constable here, we have the residents here, and the residents often, have often told me that they want to be able to ask questions to find out more about policing. And this is really, first and foremost, this is what it is. This is your meeting to talk to either myself or to the Chief or to the District Commander about issues that are of concern to you. Uh, we, the whole idea of a police and crime commissioner is to make um, inroads into the police so that you can have access. The whole idea of being a police and crime commissioner is to be the voice of residents. And to be the voice of residents, we need to come, I need to come and listen to what you have to say. And that's one of the, uh, one of the areas that you know, I will be listening very closely to the issues that you bring up today so that we can uh, address them and take them forward. Uh, during the campaign, uh, I, will, I decided to stand uh, because there were only party politicians standing. And it became very clear to me that the one thing that this role should not be is a party politician. Uh, my background is for those of you who teased me unmercifully about having donuts and bread, well, that I ran a bakery, uh, and I've been a magistrate for 15 years. I was chair on the youth um, and family and adult bench. I was um, part of the, I was vice chair of the independent monitoring board at Bristol Prison, and I was on the police authority for the previous two years. So I have a great interest in. Um, in the police and the criminal justice system. So when this job came up, because this is what it was, the campaign was just a very public interview, uh, it, I, it became clear to me that I would have to put my head above the parapet and decide that I would stand. Um, basically to give residents a choice. Uh, I felt that uh, if uh, uh, there were no other, res no, no other independent standing, and so I was, I was decided that I was going to offer a choice. 
during the campaign, I had some supporters here, and uh, it was done on a, uh, a with a very very small team, uh, and it was when we went into the uh, count at UWE at uh, University of West of England, an enormous building. I mean, in a room larger than you can possibly ever imagine, sort of aircraft hangar size, basically. Uh, I had. My, my one aim was to make sure that I got the deposit back. The deposit was £5,000. And driving to the count, uh, I drove over with my kids. I say my kids, they're all in their 20s, but you know, those of you who've got adult kids, you know that they're always your kids. And I said, of course, you know, if we don't get the £5,000, Christmas is going to be cancelled for a few decades. And kids being kids, you know, me, 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 were then terribly concerned that I must get that £5,000 back. So we walked in and there were hundreds of, of tellers, uh, I've not been to a camp before, hundreds of tellers and with the four boxes in front of them with the four candidates. And we walked around and I thought, God, how embarrassing this is going to be, it's like if I don't even get a vote. You know, I know my mum and my husband's voted for me, but and my kids tell me they have, but the kids do. Um, uh, and I have to say that when they started to count and they, I, got my, I saw my first, the first name go into my box, I said, yes, I've got one vote. Uh, seven hours later, 125,000 votes later, um, and I was um, declared the new police crime commissioner. But on a more serious note, the residents have told me during the campaign and after the campaign that they have real concerns about, and, and these concerns we have put into the police and crime plan. So, the priorities that I've asked the police to address is, first of all, antisocial behaviour. I've never been to one residence meeting where antisocial behaviour has not been of prime concern. It is because it alters people's behaviour day in and day out. Most of us will not come into contact with people who have been um, murdered or um, seriously sexually assaulted or whatever. But you know, antisocial behaviour changes our behaviour, it changes the way that we let our kids play in the park, it changes the way we walk to the shops, it changes the way that we sleep at night because of noise. So antisocial behaviour is a really key concern and, and that's why that's the uh, a priority. Second priority was violence against women and children. Uh, we need to do far more. It is, it is, uh, we get to the, we've got to the point now where victims and survivors feel that they are to, to blame, that it is their fault. And, uh, and we, get, we get very few um, recorded incidents. We, it's estimated only 15% of those crimes are reported and we need to do far more to encourage people to report so that we can find the perpetrators. The third priority is um, burglary. Now burglary has dropped dramatically uh, and you know I'm, but I'm very much aware that uh, there are some hot spots in some uh, areas where it has increased uh, and we need to again to address those issues and, and look to see how we can copy other police forces who have who do better than able in Somerset. And finally, being the voice of victims. I don't believe that victims have a loud enough voice. And it is really clear that we need to have a far more integrated uh, service for our victims. Victims on average, uh, I am told, can be asked to repeat their stories to 18 different agencies. So they tell their story 18 different times to 18 different people. And we're asking that victim to relive that crime. And that is not acceptable. We have to do far more joined up. I mean, it's, one, it's, it's uh, uh, a waste of resources because we can do things better. But actually, we're not thinking of the victim. We're thinking the various organisations, the third sector, voluntary organisations, We've got to be much more joined up, and um, that's one of the areas that um, I'll be working on. The, the police and crime plan, for the first time, we have done six local police and crime plans. So there is a, uh, a local police and crime plan for Somerset East, and it is addressing 
some of the issues that have been raised. When, when we went out to consultation, we had over 2,000 people who came back to talk to us about their ideas, and we have absorbed those into the police and crime plan. So apart from the priorities that were endorsed by majority of residents, we've also uh, included one of the things that come very clearly from residents is that they want us, they want the police to address road safety. Now road safety can mean different things to different people. It can mean cycling on pavements, it can mean speeding through villages. And it's very important that the police look at this to see how, how we can focus on that area. And then the other priority they wanted was making sure that we made officers and PCSOs more visible, visible and accessible. And so that is uh, an addition. So you can see that we went out and we, we really did consult. It wasn't a consultation plan that so many of us have received. Oh, you make some input and then nothing gets changed. Uh, we actually did, did change it. Looking at uh, the areas of, uh, of concern that we need to police and, uh, and particularly in local areas, we need to listen very, very closely to residents. We need to a, work and support uh, the things that residents lead. So community speed watch, neighbourhood neighborhood watch, farm watch, uh, PACs. We need to be very supportive of that. And, and one of the things that I'll be working with the constabulary on how we can make them more effective. Because they can be really effective. There are some brilliant um, PACs and there are some that are not so good. So what makes the ones that really work? Because, you know, for me, success is not the number of people who turn up to a pact, actually. It's the number of people who know that it's going on. There was, I was often asked, why can't we have meetings with local officers and local PCSOs? And I said, well, you can, they, they're happening. But the communication loop wasn't working. There were people, there were a lot of, lot of residents who don't know that they exist. So we need to do far more communication and, and and make sure we're talking about the issues that the residents are interested in. I'm also um, wanting to uh, increase the number of volunteers and also increase the number of specials over the next couple of years. One of the areas that uh, I campaigned on and have been very clear is that we need to talk, we need to listen far more to our young people. Young people don't necessarily come to our um, PACs and don't, aren't necessarily uh, ready to engage always with the police. So it is important that we go out and we listen. And that's, you know, not that I have, I'm not suggesting a youth PCC. I am, I am working with um, different, having a youth forum, which is far more representative of your, all young people across the whole of Avon Somerset, so that we can, so that they can have their input and we, we need to move away from stigmatising the young and we need to move away from, from the from young people stigmatising the police. It's all to do with people, it's all to do with relationships and if we can get um, residents to look beyond the hoodie, if we can get young people to look beyond the uniform as far as the police are concerned, and we can build on those relationships and I think that is a real way forward. Um, Again, with the neighbourhood policing teams, I'm very supportive of this model. I think it is the way forward. I'm also very supportive of PCSOs. PCSOs are, um, as I can tell from many, many emails and uh, letters that I've received, you know, residents value PCSOs greatly. And if we are to continue to police by consent, which I think is the way that we will be able to do, we need to have relationships with residents, and PCSOs are absolutely vital to that because they have time to have relationships when there is not a crisis, and that is key. Uh, and I think that we, we meddle with that, with that um, model at our, at our peril. Um, we are also looking at, um, we're starting a business crime forum. Uh, you know, because businesses do not have a vote, it is, they are quite might often be um, uh, passed over as far as having a voice and that's an, an area that I want to address because they are vital to our economy and it's, it's important that the police and businesses work together so that we can, um, we can one, create more employment because we know the more employment there is, uh, the fact that if we look at our offenders when they come out of prison, if we can offer them employment, 
reoffending drops dramatically. So it is a very important area. Because one of the one of the areas of the um, one of the, re the remit of the Police and Crime Commission is much wider than the previous police authority. It involves crime prevention, so looking to prevent crime from happening in the first place. Because obviously, if we do that, that's a win-win situation. It's oversight of the police, and then at the other end, it's the criminal justice system having oversight of there and making sure that as an, in it's an entirety that we stop working in silos. We can make a real difference together and not just pass offenders, perpetrators, you know, victims or whatever through the system, just passing them from one organisation together. We have to be joined up, we have to be talking and we have to be listening. So the Police and Crime Commissioner has a, a, a much bigger role than the Police Authority. And if I can just say to those who may think, well, what's the point of the Police and Crime Commissioner, because I know that was uh, an issue that was raised earlier, that the Police Authority in its previous year had a total of about 260 emails, letters, texts. In the first 10 weeks, I had, my office had over 2,000. So that shows that there's a real interest. And the fact that you're all here today shows that there is a real interest. And, you know, I want to be, and this is a really unsexy word, a facilitator, but I want to be the conduit between residents, because I'm your voice, and the police. And so this is, a, this is the beginning of opening the police and making sure that they are here to listen to your messages. Uh, so that's about, that's more than enough for me. So I think if we, if we listen to Nick Garvin, who is the Chief Constable, and then we will listen to... Nikki Watson, the district commander, and then we will open up for any questions before we go on to further presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, good morning, everybody. Nick Garvin, Chief Constable of, uh, this is day 44 for me as uh, Chief Constable. I get that in early in the hope that it might have earned me uh, a slightly easier ride in questioning if, uh, if, if I'm not all over the detail. Although when I spoke to you a wee bit about the, uh, the constabulary in general, uh, Nikki, uh, Chief Superintendent Nikki Watson will brief you about our Somerset East district. Um, I thought I'd talk about uh, four things really. Firstly, I'd say a very brief thing about me, uh, and then secondly, I'll just give you some first impressions as the new Chief Constable uh, of the Constabulary. The third thing is to talk about the financial challenge, and then fourthly, just about uh, listening and, and, and kind of um, priorities moving forward. Um, so the first of us, I joined the police service in 1988, uh, fresh from a degree in languages at the University of Leicester and joined Leicestershire Constabulary where I policed for nearly a couple of decades actually, albeit about uh, three years out in the middle of the National Criminal Intelligence Service. found myself in Paris at the time of the Princess Diana Road accident and then worked on that inquiry for uh, well, on and off for a very long time actually until the inquest, uh, which was just a few years ago. Um, but that was, uh, I worked on it full time for a few months. Back to Leicester and then worked as a uh, district, uh, district commander there. Quite interesting actually, very similar pressures in Leicester to those in Haven and Somerset, in that you have a police force with a city that kind of drags the resources into the, uh, into the urban area and you have rural areas that, that are anxious about the levels of policing they received. Now, I had this contrast between Rutland on the eastern fringes of the constabulary um, and the city of Leicester, and, and my patch spanned the two, uh, and there were, uh, there were indeed tensions between them. Um, then I went to uh, Thames Valley Police as Assistant Chief and was responsible for rolling out neighbourhood policing there, recruiting 530 police community support officers and, and absolutely endorsed what Sue's just said about the value of those PCSOs in communities and in particular in rural communities. Um, it really influenced my, uh, my development as a police leader. From <coughs> From there, I went to the National Policing Improvement Agency, just in time to close it down as it happened. There was an election in 2010, as you know, and um, the NPIA was a non-departmental public body, um, aka a quango, um, and it uh, sadly went on the bonfire of the quangos, and it was my job to close it down, but ensure that it continued to deliver services to policing. It's a big organisation, a £500 million organisation, 
um, where we needed to ensure that it continued to deliver the technology services, um, critical national infrastructure, um, the national police radio system, for example, as well as national police training. And so we needed to continue all of those things uh, throughout the, uh, the close down period. Um, and then after that, um, I, I was uh, in, in need of a job, but the good news was there were a lot of new police and crime commissioners out there about to recruit chief constables, um, and, uh, and I got the job that I wanted most, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, my first impressions, the second thing I said I'd talk about, is that the constabulary is actually in pretty good shape. Um, you'll see, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the financial challenge in, in the moment, but uh, the constabulary has a less serious challenge than others. Um, and uh, it has, it's, I think there's been a programme of wise investments over recent years. It has a good estate, with some exceptions. And we've got some new buildings coming online that present a, a big opportunity to us uh, for four PFI sites, uh, private finance initiative sites, one of which is a firearms training uh, centre near Force Headquarters, the other three are custody and investigation blocks. It was a, an opportunity to, um, to, to develop the way we do our business. Um, really good people. The forces, you know, as you've perhaps seen in the press recently, we advertised for fewer than 100 vacancies. Uh, as police officers and had around 4,000 applicants. You know, we really do have the, the pick of the people, uh, the pick of the people we, uh, we, we want when it comes to recruiting police officers, and that's reflected in a very able workforce. Nowhere, I have no intention of embarrassing Nicky, but nowhere is our workforce more able than at that level just underneath the chief officer team. Our group of chief superintendents are as able a, a, a cadre, as talented a cadre of, uh, of, of senior police leaders as I've seen in any police force, and we're going to need to harness their talents moving forward because the challenges ahead are, uh, are, are tricky. Um, in terms of the attitude of the workforce, the, the values of the workforce, my predecessor Colin Ports, I think, uh, got, got a lot of this absolutely right. I, I looked at the force values when I was preparing for the interview, and uh, they're fourfold. The first is we believe in doing today's work today, not endlessly pushing people back into calling them back and delaying appointments, etc., etc. Uh, officers are reminded that they need to be friendly, professional, and interested. They're reminded that quality counts, and they're reminded that the public comes first. Um, and uh, there's, there's nothing I'd quibble with in any of those. And I think those values are well embedded in the workforce, and compared to other police forces, I think that, uh, that the attitude of staff and evidence in the constabulary is, is generally very good. That's not to say that it can't be improved. Uh, that's not to say that everybody has a good day every day. But by and large, I think that, uh, that the attitude is good. Um, the organisation is performing well. Uh, crime is down. Crime's been falling steadily and it fell again last year. We've not, uh, we've not yet published the figures and I know we're, we're on the record this morning. So these are, these are unconfirmed figures, but uh, around 14% was last year's crime reduction. Now, I know that people are sceptical about statistics, but what that does is it means that the number of victims of crime has dipped below 100,000 across the force area for the first time since we've been recording crime. And, and that's got to be good news. Of course, the vast majority of those offences aren't the most serious. Um, and generally, the constabulary has a very good reputation uh, across policing uh, as a, an organisation with a tough job to do, um, but a job that it does very well. Um, that, please don't interpret any of that as complacency. There, are, there is, of course, a lot we could do better. Um, and we have a stern financial challenge, which I'll turn to in a second. But uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad point to be starting off from as a new chief. The financial challenge is probably the, the defining, uh, defining challenge, uh, it will certainly be the defining challenge of my tenure as Chief Constable and, and Sue's as Police and Crime Commissioner. It's, it's the big context. Um, we know that the central grant to policing was cut by, uh, by about a fifth um, for this spending re review period. And this constabulary is about 62% of its funding comes from that central grant, so a fifth of that two thirds has gone. Um, and precept, the amount that we ask uh, local taxpayers to pay for, uh, for their policing has been frozen for three consecutive years. 
So as prices go one way and the budget goes the other way, that creates a gap and um, we've had to make savings and no doubt when we get to question and answer um, you will be, uh, you'll be wanting to know about you know, PCSO coverage and, and staffing reductions and police officer reductions. The fact is that uh, there was a time that this was a constabulary of over 3,300 officers. Today it's a constabulary of rather fewer than 2,900 officers. Um, and we'll similarly be making reductions in the number of, uh, of, of police community support officers. Um, and it's our job to, uh, to make those cuts as sensibly and as wisely as we possibly can to continue to, uh, to, continue to provide a good service. So when we start talking about police stations, and when we start talking about the number of senior commanders, um, my approach is to make savings in those sorts of areas so that we keep to a minimum the number of people we need to take off the front line. So if that means providing estates in, in partnership with the Police and Crime Commissioner at a reduced cost, if that means not having big buildings that are expensive to run that are, at, that are about 25% full, then I think that's a sensible thing to do. And if we can manage to have fewer senior commanders so that we can keep more people on the beat, then again, I think that's like a very sensible approach and it's the approach that, uh, that we'll be adopting. And then the fourth thing, they're looking forward. Um, we're here to listen. And, um, and, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the interactions we're about to have. But my start point is that as we move towards the end of the spending review period, and we anticipate it's entirely likely that there will be further cuts beyond the end of the spending review period uh, in the financial years 15, 16 and 16, 17, potentially of, um, of around 5% in each of those two years. Uh, we need to work out what are the things we're going to cling to, what are the things that are going to be most important to us because we may have to make compromises in other areas. And I think the first of the things that I want to cling to, and I'd be welcome, be very eager to hear your views on this, is the neighbourhood policing model. I think it's really successful. I remember within my service, within my memory as a police commander, people saying they genuinely never saw the police. And I think the arrival of police community support officers, um, and indeed the rollout of neighbourhood policing, has genuinely transformed that. And I think policing is much more visible. Than it, than it was in the period of the run-up to 2005-06. And I want to cling on to those gains because I think they're important. But sitting behind that, the other thing that's important to me, and again, this is where the legacy of my predecessor is, um, is, is a strong one, is that commitment that enables us to take on serious and organised crime. Because whilst you may not be able to see it, we, we know it's there, and of course it's less prevalent in, in, a, in a nice area like this than it is in some of the other areas that I'm responsible for policing, but it's there nonetheless. And indeed, I know there's a, there's a, a problem in Froome this very week with, um, with burglars who have been operating in the area, and we can't let our guard down against that threat. And some of that, um, some of that calls for investment that you'll never see. Um, I'm the senior authorising officer for certain covert tactics, the most intrusive covert tactics, and our covert teams keep me busy authorising activity that gets us right into the heart of serious and organised crime networks and organised criminal gangs. And you may not see that, but that work's hugely important and it's actually very expensive. But I think we need to maintain the two sides of that capability. On the one hand, the visible, friendly, responsive, open neighbourhood policing capability, and on the other hand, um, a, a covert, effective, um, robust response to the threat of serious and organised criminality. And those two things uh, work hand in hand. We're obviously also very much influenced by Sue's priorities as the Police and Crime, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, and I walked into this very much with my eyes open. I'm one of those chiefs who's got no excuses. I, I, I came along after the Police and Crime Commissioner and, and embraced that plan and uh, happily, readily signed up to, to those priorities. I'd also signed up to that way of working, of being open. I think the opportunity to come here and have a conversation of the sort we're having this morning is a, is a really good opportunity. Uh, I was just, just explaining to Harvey that I've also volunteered to go along and uh, speak to full council at, uh, at Mendip and indeed all the other local authorities. I think it's right that people should be able to drag the chief in from time to time and find out what's happening. Um, it's it's a, good, uh, a good habit to get into. 
Um, and we'll also explore the other ways of being accessible via social media, via the internet, etc. Indeed, when I first arrived at the constabulary, I got all the senior people together, the chief inspectors and the police staff equivalents and above, and said, here's the, here's the pitch, here's the presentation I gave to, got the, to get the job. I want you to know what I've said because you know, we're going to be delivering this together. And, and they, were, they were receptive to that, thankfully. But what we also did was publish that presentation internally on the first internet so that staff can see it. And now we've put it up on the internet so that anybody who wants to see it can see it. And that's just uh, on our force uh, YouTube site. And that's pretty much the way I want to operate. Let's be open, let's have an open discussion. We won't always agree, but uh, we'll certainly always listen. Right, okay, so can we have first some questions? Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Sue on her appointment, if it's not uh, too late to do that. <coughs> I think many of us view this appointment with mixed feelings. Certainly, a majority of people I spoke to are unhappy about the, the, the fact that it might be a politicised appointment. That, that's almost a unanimous uh, feeling. So um, um, I think the best thing we can do about that is just to wish you a, a, a great deal of uh, support from the community in doing your job well. And uh, certainly in terms of um, in terms of visiting the, 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 the people in the community, of course, we're, we're, we're very pleased to see you. My, my particular remit is uh, as a member of the uh, Never watch uh, uh, scheme. I think, um, uh, 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 as you intimated, uh, this is in Shetland Island, that there have been problems there, there are problems which uh, I'm not sure it's appropriate to go into too much detail because it would be relevant for, 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 for the, wider, the, the, the wider audience, but uh, there have been problems there. I think uh, one of the things which you, you, you did highlight and which which uh, it, it is extremely important is the cut back in the, the, the cut back in finances. It's something that's happening not only in, uh, in policing, it's happening in health, it's happening in education, it's happening in social welfare. It is a big problem. It's a big problem. Um, I think uh, when the money is uh, pulled back, the, 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 the recipients of, of those services aren't going to disappear. They're still there. And uh, the, 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 there are going to be uh, problems of, uh, in, in my view, problems of poverty, which uh, the, 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 the police service need to address. Um, I think that the distinction which several of you made between um, um, peacekeeping and law enforcement it, 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 it is paramount. The problem is, is that uh, because of those reductions in finances, I think that. Uh, it's easier to do law enforcement than concentrate on 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 on, 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 on peacekeeping, keep peacekeeping, which probably has more uh, long-term benefits as it were. So, so 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 really, my 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 uh, my question is, what do we do about the uh, about the uh, uh, about the withdrawal in finances? You, 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 you obviously have thought about it, but uh, it, it, is there anything more specific? Well, as I indicated in the presentation I gave, um, there, are, there are more and less sensible ways of taking money out of um, money out of an organisation, and uh, the, the, the less I can spend on cars, the, the, the fewer I can get away with having commensurate with a, with a uh, with a good service, the less I pay for my forensics, the less I spend on buildings and heating them and uh, and, and the like, uh, the more cash is available for delivering frontline services. Um, I look at places like uh, Western Sydney now, where uh, recently Sue and I saw that um, what used to be nine different inquiry offices open to the public have been consolidated into one one-stop shop so that people can go and access police and council services together. And it seems to be a very sensible thing to do that because uh, it means that it means that we're only paying one set of rates, one set of bills, etc., etc. And it, it, it means when you're sustaining cuts, a higher proportion 
of the cash you spend is going on the front line. And we know that a high proportion of our people are on the front line, even though it's it's a reducing a reducing workforce. Um, so it's all of those things I think around the periphery um, that, that support the delivery of service. Uh, we, we need to um, bear down on the cost of those things to preserve the front line and then set very high standards for the front line. I don't want patrolling officers um, spending their life worrying about budget cuts. You know, I want them to concentrate on spending the £270 million pounds we'll spend next year wisely rather than worrying about the few million that we've got to save. And, and leave, leave the worry about the few million we've got to save to the likes of Sue and me, and, and we'll try and cut as wisely as we can. Okay. My name's Ashley Ray, I'm from Community Speed Watch. I've already sent an email in previously about um, that PCSO has been. Generally, the gist of it is, is that why can't the PCSO have extended powers to assist us along the roadside? For example, he or she comes along, stands there, very nice, stays for an hour, half an hour, whatever, and goes away. The, the, the RPU has been, uh, let me say, less visible in the last six or nine months. So what are we asking for? More officers? No. Pay them more? No. Take them, from, take them away from their current duties? No. Just while they're there, why can't they have extra powers to stop, caution, issue NIPs, do what one wants to do? To me, that seems to be a cost-effective way of utilising the PCSO with no extra cost involved. We've discussed, <coughs> excuse me, a lot about cost today. And here's a way to improve the system, the service to the public, with no extra cost. So, why can't it be done? Uh, Mr. Ag, congratulations on a very short snow, by the way. I think you and I are the two first options. I thought you'd listen to me. You, 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 I thought I'd gain your attention. <laughs> it's uh, obviously I'm, words. I'm not going to be looking at your legs, I promise you. But, uh, <laughs> you, remember said, this, you remember this question, no others. Oh, I will remember it, and I'm, I'm not prepared for it. Um, firstly, on the subject of PCSO powers, the Chief Constable has discretion. There are some powers that all PCSOs have. And there are some powers that chief constables have the discretion uh, to give them or withhold from them. Um, and as you look around, forces have put down the country. The picture is, surprise, surprise, uh, a, a varied one. Uh, I arrived a few weeks ago, as I said, and one of the first conversations that Sue and I had was um, on the back of feedback and questions that she'd been asked. She asked me to have a look at the uh, powers that, that I give to PCSOs, and I've given that job to Chief Superintendent Louisa Rolf, who is one of this very able card that I was referring to earlier on, and she is getting on with that. She's doing consultations, she's looking at what happens in other forces, she's asked our own PCSOs what they think via a, a web chat, um, and she is nearing a position where she will make some recommendations to me, which I'll discuss with Sue, and then we'll decide what to do. But, irrespective of what she comes up with, she's not going to help on this particular problem, because the powers that you'd like our PCSOs to have aren't on the menu that they could have. And that question was raised in Parliament recently, um, and there was scant appetite on the part of parliamentarians to do anything to change that situation. So, the simple answer to your question on PCSO powers is, we can't change them all. Um, but if it were to change, then I'd be entirely content to consider, uh, to, to consider giving them uh, additional powers. Uh, uh, it's not something I have a, a huge need strong opinion on either way and I'm very happy to take advice. More generally there's this question, what do we do about speed levels? And uh, Sue's also asked me to have a, have a look at that. We've got, we've got a mobile speed detection capability, uh, we've got six cameras that are the, the subject of, um, of, of discussion in their own right, and we have a road policing unit that has been reducing in size as part of the, uh, as part of the budget cuts that I've described to you. On the road policing unit, I think that we could make it more resilient by combining it and making it work collaboratively with the units in both Wiltshire and Gloucestershire. And we're exploring that at, uh, at the moment. Indeed, uh, Sue and I will be in Exeter tomorrow with the chiefs of Gloucester, Wiltshire, Devonport, and Dorset. Further exploring the way we can make our money go further by collaborating across police force boundaries. Um, and I think the mobile enforcement team is, is a team that's worthy of further investment. I think the next steps for that might be to go from the vans 
to motorbikes. We've found a speed camera you can mount on a motorbike and it means that you can place them in places where you can't fit a van. And having just driven down here from uh, from Bristol today, there's many a corner. I wouldn't fancy sitting in a van and feel about a vulnerable target. So, so I'm quite optimistic about what we'll be able to achieve there. Um, and I think we also should have a discussion about uh, the the optimum benefit from fixed cameras too, which is something that the mayor of, uh, of Bristol has been. Uh, has been raising uh, raising recently and to which uh, to which soon I will be responding. So and there's quite a lot we can do. I don't think PCSO powers is, is necessarily the answer, but absolutely um, you know this is it can be very dangerous when people uh, people drive irresponsibly and we need to do something about it. Thank you for your honest answer. Thank Um, I'm Paul Quinn, I'm the town clerk here in Froome. Um, thanks ever so much for coming. It's, it's great and brilliant that you came here first because we're the best town in the <laughs> um, I'd like to pick up a couple of things that, that Sue, you were talking about building relationships and partnerships, and, and, and one that, that Nick was talking about, the savings. Um, we've all seen, and I think Nick, you're possibly referring to, to our police station here in Froome, slightly bigger than you possibly need and, um, and, and there's a really nice big for sale sign on it and, 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 and all of us I'm sure are really interested to see so where will you go then when you move out. Um, in Froome we're really enthusiastic about partnerships um, and, and see an opportunity for the police and the town council, the district and the county to sort of coalesce with third sector organisations to create a really functioning and, and, and dynamic Froome hub and one of the county council buildings that is, uh, again, rumoured at the moment to be up for sale is the social services building, the, the old rural district council offices. It just seems to, to a lot of us an ideal place to generate this room up. And I'm really wondering whether you'd like to come and talk to us about uh, informally or formally, however you like, about how we might be able to move that forward. To, to do that, um, I think it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very helpful offer. Um, the problem with the, with the current police station is it's, uh, it's A, it's too big, and B, it's in the wrong place. Um, I'd like there to be a base right in town, so there's an opportunity here. I was chatting to Clive earlier on, one of the, the volunteers, and we agreed that the current one, you know, great, great as it is, as a, 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 a dropping centre, um, it's probably, you'd want something more further down the line. Clive might can do it with a dog, which I thought was, was very good. Um, so yes, yes, we should. Yes, we should have that conversation. The very hub you described is precisely the, con the, the concept that I was just referring to over in, in Western Supermare, um, and, uh, and, and uh, seems to me an eminently sensible thing to pursue. Of course, these things are, are commercially sensitive, but we don't want to push the, push the potential price of, uh, of any uh, particular building up by demonstrating our interest in it here, but uh, in, in principle we, we should have that, uh, that conversation. I think we may end up with a two-centre solution so that we've actually got the kind of inquiry desk drop-in face-to-face facility in town and a response space maybe not necessarily in town and then we might even have an opportunity to make some use of a proportion of the current site to deliver that response space further down the line, um, and I can quite see how, how that might be part of the parcel of uh, the deal to dispose of the site. Um, so, uh, absolutely interested in what we've had to say, and think there's a positive basis to have a further discussion. Thank you. So, the one with the black jacket? Mm -hmm.
Good morning, Graham Newings. <coughs> I'm delighted to say, Commissioner, I voted for you. I'm a younger sibling who said you had an house. And I think to date you've shown that. You've brought a breath of fresh air to what some of us knew as the former uh, authority. And I said, we never came across the chairman of authority. In fact, you probably couldn't name the last five of them. Uh, this panacea, Chief Superintendent, that you paint of Somerset East, and I say it with a background of it as a trustee of Victim Support Somerset, it was. I've heard too much about uh, Victim Support latterly. Um, and of course, your, your pub thing, I thought, amused me somewhat in as much that I knew you were a predecessor. <laughs> And for you to have said that, you know, that there was a pub problem, uh, he certainly had his finger on the pulse. I'm here today, Commissioner, I've been the victim of ASB, my sister has in Wells, and I am critical of it, and I'm very mindful of it, being critical of the police. Um, it's, I, I'm not sure it is joined up. Um, my experience, uh, latterly, was a visitation from the civilian you mentioned uh, with the Wells Beat Officer. I've never met my uh, neighbourhood on North uh, 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 Mendip uh, Beat Officer. Uh, and they went away saying they would go and talk to uh, somebody who was going to speak in my support. But they never visited. They emailed him and they subsequently had a telephone conversation. You, you said, Chief, that um, you mentioned 100,000. There's a date on line of 100,000. Well, did, did I hear that right? Sorry, could you? On, on ASB, you, you mentioned a figure of 100,000. I said fewer than 100,000 crimes recorded across the 1.6 million people of Edmund Somersets in the last year. But that's, that's, not, but that's a lot of people, isn't it? You know, there's it's, 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 it's still a lot of people. Uh, so all I'm saying is, Chief Superintendent, it wants having a look at top down and bottom up your, your, your ASB. Um, I've been around long enough. In fact, I was the original member of the Police Liaison Committee for Mended District Council post Scarlet. So we go back a long, we go back a long way. Uh, Neighbourhood Watch again. I want to be constructive. I was interested to hear what Shepton Mallet was saying. When I was with it on the vine. Mended. I raised that when I had the visitation from your ASB civilian and the Wells Beat officer. I gave him the I gave him the benchmark of how we did operate it. It it works very well, I understand, in Wells, but it's fraying at the edges. Um, so I think that's all I just want to say. That uh, what what intrigues me about ASB, it, it, you're quite right, Commissioner. That it affects you in different ways, and it's across it's across social d d demographics. Um, the civilian you've got, and he's, he struck me as a very capable uh, young man, um, had been hospitalised for a fortnight or so, and he, he mentioned his disease now, which he didn't have to do, of course, and conceded that he came back to 143 unopened emails. Well, presumably he's got a line manager. One would have expected the line manager or somebody to have got a grip of that. So there you are. I've come along this morning constructively to say, you know, you, you're doing okay, but you can do a far lot better. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, I'll just say um, it, the whole benefit for me to come to a meeting like this is to hear from the people like you that are affected. So it's very helpful to get that feedback. and. Um, and I will catch you with the livings afterwards just to make sure that, that there's nothing else that we can do for you at the moment, just to hear some of the detail. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Berryman. I'm a retired police officer, having served at Troon from 1960 to 1988. And all the things you've mentioned this morning, about dealing with crime, dealing with disorder, I used to do all that. I haven't heard anything that you said that I didn't do. So, with the greatest of respects, I was very upset to think that I didn't do anything for nearly 30 years. 
Thank you. I don't think any of us are saying that she didn't do anything. I bet you didn't deal with cyber stalking. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I dealt with, as a policeman, what I used to have to deal with. Um, anybody that's over 60 here might know me. Thank you. And thank you for all the work that you did do. And no one said that, uh, you know, that you were not doing a, a, a great job. That's the impression I get. It's not the impression that we intend to give. Uh, Jim and Frank, so that was very nice here from Tom. I remember Tom. I was a special for 13 years in Froome. And I also been out with Tom many a times. Um, it's when Froome had a police force, which they don't even have now, uh, because uh, we used to go on patrol with the police when I was special, and um, out in the evenings and in the night times. And many a time Tom ran the Mexican suite. Um, when it used to be sort of punch ups years ago, around there, we used to get that under control. No, not too many. <laughs> um, but now there's nobody about. We see no police around at all now. I mean, there's nobody on the streets at all now. Um, I mean, we got the speed watch. Um, there's a gentleman coming to speed watch. Now, we as specials uh, have the same powers as the police. I know the PCOs have not the spe their powers, so why couldn't some specials go with the speed watch? Because they could give out the tickets. Like we used to give out tickets, just the same, you know, um, and that's what we used to do years ago when we had a, what we call a police force in through. Um, but now we don't seem to have anything. And also, I read recently the CID is going through through. That we have no detectives in through. Where we used to have a strong CID branch at the station, you know. Um, so everything seemed to be going the pot instead of the other way around, you know. Um, congratulations to Sue. I did vote for her because she was the only independent. But I did write to David Cameron um, when all this came up about the commissioners that really the money would have been well spent on putting more people on the beat. Because that's what people want, is to see coppers on the beat. Not people running behind the desk and just sort of things out know, and also getting all these high amounts of money and all money going everywhere um, in the wrong direction. Um, so that is um, my point of view really, is we want to see more people about you know, and I know the specials have gone off in Froome. Not many specials in Froome now, I understand. Uh, but we used to have a nice strong lot. And uh, we used to do quite a lot in Froome in them days, uh, as Tom can remember. But as Tom said, don't tell too many secrets. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, and others for decades and decades was utterly lamentable. 
um, and, and we've improved our response to that. We've improved, improved our response to serious sexual assault, where again, the, the, the record of policing over a period of decades was very poor indeed. Um, but the effects of all of that, as indeed I mentioned the response to serious and organised crime. Um, I've, I've developed undercover units, we've got surveillance teams, we've got people who can do technical surveillance. They're all people who, if we weren't doing it, they could still be on the beat. But in my professional opinion, you are better served by having that formidable capability to combat serious and organised crime, even though you don't see it every day. And you may disagree, um, and that's why we're here to listen, and we'll no doubt end up with a balance. And certainly what I've said a couple of times already, I'll repeat it now, in making the cuts that I absolutely have to make, and I would love nothing more than somebody to give me £4 million and say, here, here, a few extra PCSOs, or indeed a few extra officers, that would be a happy day indeed for me. But until that day comes, and given that I will have to make cuts, I just think we need to make them as sensibly as we can and take the money out of the bits of the business that aren't front line. So I think I'm agreeing with you in that, but I think my excuse is that it's really quite complicated. My name's Jamie Blake, very small, so I have a question for him. It's a question for all of us. At the end of the day, the policing costs today are high. It's not your fault, it's what you're given. The answer to it is, why do smart A lawyers, when you get the right case, turn around and be smart enough to outwit you? And I'm sorry, but this must cost you a lot of time, a lot of energy in this area and all over the country. So, Sue, what can you do about it when you go to government and say, let's stop messing about with it and let's get down to what we used to be in the basics of if a criminal is a criminal, put him away. Thank you for that. Um, one of the first points is that the law has to be well written. And when it is not well written, that's when smart art lawyers can get round it. Um, because, so it's, it's very uh, open on our government and our parliament and on the scrutiny bodies to make uh, the, the acts of Parliament very well written so that they can't get around it. But as far as the police is concerned, and that's why it's quite interesting that the remit of the, uh, of the Commissioner is far wider than the uh, police and criminal justice system, because we do, it is important that, I mean, if you think about it, you know, there is an average of the time that someone is um, charged with an offence, the time they come to court, there is a delay of five months. Now that's not right, that is not just, and it's not fair for the victim, let alone anything else. And so we have to look at ways of digitalising uh, evidence and to make sure that CPS can be far more effective. And that's why we can work together far better, so that rather than thinking that it's not long, no longer our problem, it's someone else's problem, it's by getting them all together so that we can make a, a much better. But always remember that the judiciary have to be independent from the police. It is critical that we support an independent judiciary system because we do not want to have a police state. It is the police to bring the evidence and to make it the best evidence possible, but it's then for the judge and the, and the jury, which are made up of residents, to decide whether to, to go further or not. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jane Wood and I'm the volunteer that administers the uh, police post just across the way. Um, we take messages for the police, we hand out leaflets for the police, we try to help the police and the community without getting involved and certainly without interfering. Um, I have a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, I think this is a great forum, but I'm awfully disappointed that we didn't get to hear about it until about five days ago. Most of us only saw it in the Sunset Standard. Um, and the notices that have gone around were totally inadequate, so I'm sorry, but next time can we have a bit more notice? Um, the other thing is, I think PCSOs are brilliant, and I'm certainly a great supporter of them. But my question is this, um, from the police post, um, we found one frustration that the public have expressed to us, and it concerns untaxed cars in Mendip District Council car parks, in other words, this one particularly, but sometimes some of the others. Um, we've been told that the police are unable to issue any tickets because the vehicles are on private property, uh, i.e. MDC land. Uh, these cars are usually in a rickety state, so they are probably unknown worthy as well. 
Is there anything that you can do to improve the situation and getting them brought to board? Thank you for that. Before I pass on a more difficult question to Nikki, um, can I just say that uh, I apologise for you not having that information. This is the first uh, of our forums and uh, we will make sure that we... That, that is um, that is um, uh, that's the question we had. It's, it's on an address label. Okay. We will do better. <laughs> I can assure you. Thank you. Yeah, no, in, in respect of the, um, the vehicle and the tax problem, we obviously can only work within uh, legislation that we have. But one of the most important things for us is that we tackle the issues that are important to the community. So if members of the public are coming in and giving us the details of vehicles, then um, we can still take those vehicles and we can look for them when they're on the road. We can find out where they, uh, the registered keepers live so that we can patrol those areas and maybe catch them on the road. So um, I'm make sure that the information is still passed to us and we'll do what we can if, if we can't do them in the car park. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I have sent details of my question to you in emails and I went down to Wells when you had your open day and gave them to you then there. I'm being critical this morning of Nikki and I had the opportunity before the meeting of speaking to her and explaining why I was being critical. My name is Robin Bradbury, I'm a past chairman of Colford Parish Council. My concern is the allocation of PCSOs to the rural villages. One thing I've learned this morning, which was interesting, is from Nick, and that is the total reduction of all ranks of uh, the force, which he gave us 3,300 to 2,900, which I make to be about 12% or something like that. The PCSOs in the rural areas around here have had a reduction of 50%, not 12%. Now, I maintain that Nicky has I would say, perhaps I would say inadvertently, but I believe that we've been misled by the repeated statements that there have been no reduction in the PCSOs in the Froome area. And as far as I'm concerned, when we started the parish warden system, which preceded the PCSO system, the warden had about four or five parishes to look after. We're now in the position, I've got last month's report from our PCSO here, 18 villages and hamlets he has to report and he has to get through and to see. We've been cut from three to two, whereas there were previously were four. I think the reduction is quite ridiculous. Well, no, that's not a fair statement. I was going to say it. I think it's quite un un unfair, the bias against the rural villages. I would couple that with something I know we're not allowed to interfere with. So nevertheless, I'll Blunder in. And that is, I do appreciate that the operational responsibility for running the police force clearly is not within our remit. It's the officers who have to do that. But I just simply observe and I read carefully the reports from our PCSO on how many occasions, for operational reasons, the rural beat PCSOs have had to be withdrawn into the urban area where they're needed. Probably quite true. I, I accept it. But again, it's the rural PCSOs that we feel the draft is an excellent service. They do a splendid job. And I really believe that the investment in PCSOs in the rural villages around Froome is well worthwhile. Thank you, Mr. Um, so, three things, just to give you a sense of, of the headcount reductions that, uh, that we're doing. The organisation, actually, when you add together the officers and the police staff and the PCSOs um, and the um, special consulting mm -hmm. range volunteers, it's an organisation of, of a shade over 6,000 people um, and, and different, um, different uh, bits of that are being affected differently. It will probably reduce the number of officers by 13% so you, you're very, very on the money there. The number of PCSOs, 17%. Um, the number of volunteers and, and, and special constables, as Sue said, will grow. The hardest hit, I suspect, will end up being the, uh, the, the 
three staff. You know, these are these are big cuts we're having to make. Um, what we don't want to do is sit at the centre at the headquarters, um, micromanaging our senior people, and, and say what they what they can and can't uh, what, what they can and can't cut. And they need to um, they need to deploy resources according to demand. But with those being shrinking resources, we need to be ever more ready to move people in response to what's actually happening on the day. And I wouldn't sanction somebody you know, tootling around, uh, tootling around villages, just sort of maintaining contact and, and, um, and, and doing normal daily business while their colleagues are perhaps at threat or we've got, you know, as we have at the moment, you know, a significant and alarming burglary problem just, just close by. I'd expect the resource to shift and indeed were the problem to shift, I'd expect um, expect the, uh, that, that uh, staff would be moved flexibly in response to that too. Um, and uh, I think one of the issues, I should actually let Nikki speak for herself, but I think because we've decided to equip one of our PCSOs locally with a particular set of skills around supporting victims, I think that's given this sort of anomalous, uh, anomalous percentage that, that you described there. But um, you know, I would hope that that has been done in response to what people are telling us. Of course, you know, the one thing we do realise is we can can't please all the people all the time, no matter how hard we try. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is that I wasn't here when we had orders, so I'm, I'm not at okay with what the arrangements were then, but I've been here for six years, and we haven't reduced the number of PCSOs in those six years. We've had nine then, we have nine now. The only difference is that if, what Yvonne Mears is not on the ground all of the time doing uh, traditional PCSO work because she does the support for the burglary victims. But um, compared to six years ago, the workforce is a lot more mobile. So um, where six years ago officers and PCSOs went to their one patch and they didn't, we didn't move them round, we now do move them round according to the demand. So it is absolutely correct that sometimes the rural PC, PCSOs are in the town, but it's also very correct that quite often some of the town PCSOs come out to the rural areas to deal with particular problems. So um, the workforce is a lot more mobile than it, than it used to be, and I think that's right, that we move to where the problems are so that we can tackle the problems more quickly. Just one other thing, of course, I appreciate this isn't a, a particularly auspicious time to be raising the issue, given that the uh, austerity has already been pointed out as a confine to the police alone. But there are some local authority areas where local authorities have elected to prioritise community safety and dig deep and support the provision of additional PCSOs. Indeed, in, in Thames Valley, uh, we recruited uh, over 50 additional PCSOs on a kind of buy one, get one free scheme with the, uh, with the local authority, the, local, the district, even at parish level on one occasion. The, the parish came up with half the funding for a PCSO, and we match funded that, and then the person was absolutely ring to that area. When we started here, the parish has made a contribution. I'm Mike Adams, a resident of Froome here. I'm a volunteer with uh, Hope Froome, the Coffee Van, and uh, Froome FM. So, uh, first of all, thank you for the support uh, from Nikki uh, for uh, this volunteer group since 2008. has been serving teas and coffees on Friday nights, part of the nighttime economy. And we started in, in partnership with the police. And uh, I noticed in your, um, in your campaign statements on Froome FM that you are very supportive of working more closely with volunteer groups like um, and the street pastors and all sorts of the community volunteer groups. And I've heard you say also, we don't want to have a silo mentality where I do my thing and you do your thing and they do something else and we don't join them up. So I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that. And uh, I hope Froome wants to know what else we can do to really have an impact here in Froome. So uh, what is your I ideas to take forward how volunteer groups who want to work uh, in partnership and closer, more closely with the police um, what sort of strategy can we have to join up and avoid the side of strategy so we can, can be even more effective in the future? Before I go to Nikki, who's our leader of volunteers, let me just say that, I, that volunteers are the way forward. You know, we, you, you are the eyes and ears, and I've seen how effective they can be. Um, and, and we have to look at we have to look at opportunities, not only within the organisation, but I think we also have to look at the, the skill set of the volunteers themselves, so that we can see what you know what you're offering and see how that can be addressed. But as far as anything specific, I'll ask. Uh, Nick. 
I'm not, I don't have time to give you my volunteer um, presentation, but if anybody wants more information afterwards, then do grab me, because we have a thriving volunteer programme in um, this district and across the force, and there are a number of different ways that people can volunteer. You can volunteer in a role where you're um, actually sort of directed and engaged by the police and you wear a uniform and you become a special constable or a police cadet um, or a volunteer in a police station who doesn't wear a uniform but assists us very much in communi communicating with um, our communities and being eyes and ears and passing messages to and from the community and us and then helping us with um, administrative tasks, putting packs together for crime prevention, uh, walking around in areas where there are, um, say, say, beauty spot car parks, where they might have some car crime, walking around in those areas, putting leaflets on the car windscreens, crime prevention advice, but in doing so, any, any criminal also probably goes off to a different car park because they don't want to be seen. Um, we also have volunteers who, um, uh, when we are investigating a crime, if the offender has been seen, there are very specific procedures we have to go through in respect of identification and putting the identification evidence in front of a court. So a member of the public will come to the police station and will have to look at some photos to see if they can identify the person. We have volunteers called chaperones who look after those members of the public whilst they're in the station. Sometimes they even go and pick them up from the home address and bring them to the station. Um, and make sure that they're happy and they know what's happening and they're looked after in the station. There are a whole host of volunteer um, opportunities, as well as the ones that we've heard about already today, like Neighbourhood Watch and Community Speed Watch, Community Justice Panels, which are a restorative justice opportunity to get involved as a volunteer. There's almost anything that you fancy doing, I bet I can find you that to do. <laughs> so if you want to volunteer, or any of your friends or relatives, or any of you know want to volunteer, then please make contact. Thank you. It's an offer you can't refuse, is it? Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm going to speak to Sorry. the uh, Just to the... Thank you. Thank you. My name is Terry Drake, I'm on the Mendic Community Speed Watch organiser. Nikki. Volunteers, please. Can you get me some? I've got my team of volunteers in Froom. This is half of them. Froom is a huge town. We operate at eight sites in Froom. I have 21 schemes going off in Rendon. I am desperate for volunteers. Really, really desperate. Anybody wants to volunteer, just call me to the local police station, leave your name, address, telephone number. I'll get in touch with you and I'll get you trained and get you out. The more of you I can get, the more teams I can put out. The more teams I put out, the more crimes we can put out. We do work very closely with our beat managers. We give them anything that uh, we feel is of interest. Untaxed cars, cars, excuse me, cars being driven in an erratic manner, PC Baker in uh, Froome, great man. We work very closely with him. He just says, give them to me, I'll deal with them. So more volunteers. Please. Thank you. I want to see you as Thank you. Uh, the gentleman at the back there. Charles Wood, how confident are you in being able to react in the right way if crime goes up? I mean, you're obviously tailoring your, with the, the cuts that you've got to deal with to what you're facing now. But when the coalition came in, they were asking for suggestions on where cuts could be made, and I said, do not touch the police, because personal priorities start with safety of home is right up there, safety of home and person is right up there with safety of country and being able to feed your family. And if people don't walk around or leave their homes and are worried about the likelihood of burglary or assault or whatever, then uh, that doesn't make for a, an easy life. And with the cuts to welfare that are coming in, and those neighbor wells who have been living on it no longer have that resource to look elsewhere, and maybe with a large increase of perhaps immigration next year with, from countries that perhaps don't have the same law abiding attitudes that we have, it is quite possible that crime will go up. 
How reactive are you to be able to deal with that? Well, thank you. I would like to dispute some of the things that, um, that you mentioned there. But as far as um, working on demand, I think Nick, you. Yeah, and um, around the time of the last election, I remember sitting at a meeting of Chief Constable's Council in, um, in London, listening to chiefs debating what, what should we say in advance of the <coughs> spending review from October 2010. What, what, what do we think policing could sustain in terms of a cut in central ground? And there are some people who say we, we should show willing and we should say we could sustain a cut of 8% or 5%. And there are others who said no, you, should, you shouldn't um, even acknowledge a number because they'll come and take double. Um, and then I think it was the then Chief Inspector of Constabulary, Sir Dennis O'Connor, who said that the police service could take 12%. Um, and then uh, the actual spending came around and it was 20%, albeit 20% of central grants, um, which affected different forces differently. Um, so in some forces, a force like Surrey gets half of its money from local taxation, so a 20% cut there isn't as big as it is in a force like Northumberland, which only gets. 12% of this funding from, from local taxation. But these, the cuts did cut, and um, I'm sure ministers would say that the decision to cut has been vindicated um, because you know, crime has continued to fall as police forces have shrunk. Um, and I think the service deserves some credit for that because actually it, it has made sensible efficiencies and, and that in turn supports the argument that there's some, there has been some fat in the system that, that we've been able to take out. To this question of how far is far enough, um, of course we don't know that you know, there's, there's an element of crystal ball gazing in that, but I do see increasingly around you know, senior management levels and around operational levels that there is a strain beginning to show and um, we will continue to work to take, to take cash out of the system in ways that will have the lowest possible impact on the frontline service um, and we'll explore all manner of partnership opportunities, collaboration opportunities, efficiency opportunities, cost reduction, etc, etc. But I think it's, um, it is without question that, that there is a degree of, of strain beginning to show. Um, it's not for the police to decide how big the police service should be, but my undertaking is, and I'll, I'll be very honest about the, the nature of that strain, and I'll be very honest with the uh, Sewers Police and Crime Commissioner, because she uh, has the responsibility to set that um, to set that other part of our budget, the bit that is raised through local taxation. And um, it's not for me to lobby for X percent, but simply to say this is what the strain looks like, and this is what the consequences of a reduction or increase of X and Y percent might, might be. Um, and in the meantime, we work as hard as we possibly can to nip crime problems in the bud, um, to keep the lid on serious organised crime, to ensure as effective a response as we can to areas of local concern, um, to prevent things uh, running away from us. Uh, almost good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad the Chief Constable is supporting uh, surveillance and technical surveillance. As an ex-police officer who ran a team for a number of years, it is very beneficial. Um, two ge general questions, really. Um, the concept of sector policing, certainly for, for the southern, southern part of uh, southern East Somerset, sometimes we have people on duty in charge and they cover up as far as we can. You know, so, so they, they, it's slightly different to, so if we have a, a one fit all type service, i.e., it's vastly different in the city of Bristol, I mean, at least both. You can have a response in Somerset, in Somerset, which is 20 minutes, and that's for the safety of police officers as well as public. But as in Bristol, on occasion, the road are blocked by responding vehicles. So, so, so there's that issue. The other thing that comes, that, that I've, and this may just be rumour, I'm told that if you want an appointment to see a police officer now from the communications, they will ring up and make an appointment. Um, as far as South and South East South is concerned, is it Wells and Yeovil are the only two places that you can go and actually have an appointment to see a police officer? If so, we have an aging population and they can't, you know, from, from Char to Yeovil or from Froome to, to Wells, it's still, it's still a considerable journey. That's one question. The other question is in relation to centralisation. 
centralization of, let's say, the custody suite, for instance. You've got a centralization of a custody suite. Now, to lose two people if they have to escort a prisoner from Bristol to a custody suite at Junction 23 is not a great loss in real manpower. But if you take two police officers from somewhere like Porlock or Froome, and they have to travel to Junction 23, then the loss is considerably greater in numbers as far as man power is concerned. They might choose themselves. Thank you. In respect of the appointment system, it's, it's a fairly new system that's been introduced, and certainly my view is if a member of the public wants to see us, we'll come to your house. So if you, if you need us to come to your house, then we'll do that. So just say that when you ring up. It's a question that I've received from the Yeah, no, of course. I'm pleased to let people know that. It reminds me of the story of the, uh, the rather well-heeled conscript in, in the British services in, in, in the 1930s. And he's at, uh, he's at his military base and he didn't fancy um, he didn't fancy doing parade and drill and, and everything on a particularly rainy morning, so he decided to throw a sickie and went in to see the base, uh, the base medic. And the medic said, looks him in the eye and realised there was absolutely nothing wrong with the bloke. He said, would you have come to see me with this in civilian life? Absolutely not, said the well heeled soldier. I'd have said for you. <laughs> well, well. Um, on the subject of uh, centralisation, um, the, the dilemma we face here, um, and I welcome people's thoughts on it, you know, custody is really expensive. You know, cell blocks are expensive to build, they're expensive to staff, and particularly when you're not arresting all that many people, but, you know, the throughput isn't enormous, it's an incredibly expensive undertaking. Uh, we're in, I've inherited a programme which I think is eminently sensible to say let's have fewer custody centres that are bigger, that work better, the throughput of people who've been arrested will be quicker, and there's the economy of scale of having all the people we've, uh, we've locked up in the same place. What that will do is free up millions of pounds over time that I then don't need to cut from the front line in neighbourhood policing. The challenge and the dilemma is, of course, it does mean that when somebody's arrested somebody, they've got to travel a little bit further with that, with that person. We aim to have a system that once they've got there, they'll drop the person off and then they're straight back so they won't have to deal with the people they've arrested. So there's, there's another benefit there. My sense is that if you balance out the inconvenience of that versus the, uh, the advantages of it, we'll be much better off than we otherwise were. Um, but, you know, there'll be pockets and places where from time to time it doesn't work well and, and, and we need to keep an eye on that. I'm very attracted by a scheme that I've seen operating with the private sector in South Wales Police, uh, which is called Street to Suite, where you don't even have to drive all the way to the custody office with your prisoner. At times, like, you know, Friday or Saturday evening when you know you're going to be busy, the private contractor actually comes to you and takes the person you've arrested off you and they take them to their custody suite and leave the officers on the street where they made their arrest. You know, they, they download the evidence from the officer and they're gone. So it's quite experimental. Um, but as we roll out these new sites, including the one you mentioned at, uh, at uh, Junction 23, um, we need to make sure that we make the most of our opportunity. I can't afford that transition into these new buildings to cost a 10% hit in performance. I need it to provide a 2, 3, 4, 5% improvement in performance. Uh, not least because of the question we've just had about you know, how, how far is it far enough in, in terms of the cuts. Can I just ask a very quick point? It's particularly because I think you're from Somerton, aren't you? Um, Yeovil is the main custody for the Somerton area, and Yeovil custody is remaining open as well. Thank you. So it's not closing. Excuse me, you said about having private companies delivering prisoners. They've been doing it for decades. What happens if the prisoner escapes? Well, they've been taking. I remember when I was a young PC, there was uh, the introduction of court services where we didn't take people to court anymore. G4S, Serco, uh, and others did. Um, and they had a few escapes in the first few weeks, did Group 4, and, um, and um, then very quickly they sorted it out. And now, actually, nobody in their right mind would turn the clock back. It's the same principle. You pop somebody in the cell bus and you drive them to the police station and you leave the officer on the street. Seems like a good idea to me. Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to 
I am aware of the time, and for those of the people who've still got questions that they want to raise, if you could come and see any of my team, then that would be really useful and we will make sure that we get back to you. Anyone who's emailed me questions that we haven't responded to, again, <coughs> we, will, we will get back to, back to you. I think you've, you've seen um, this is a, a really useful, we've had a really useful debate here. I think it's, it's, it, it shows the way forward. And it shows why, you know, why there is a uh, police and crime commissioner to organise this, to get this up and running so that, and every two months we will have a debate like this around the force area so that we can listen very closely to what residents at the say and the constabulary can listen and, uh, and we, can, we can take a view. But first of all, I'd like to thank, well, thank my team and thank for everyone in Froome who have helped um, organise this meeting. Uh, I think the, the fact that uh, it has gone so successfully is, is testament to, to their work. I'd like to thank Nick and Nikki and the constabulary for coming and, and answering the uh, questions. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, because without you, we would not be, we would not be able to achieve this. So thank you.